Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Laura Kortner is our executive producer, and Sean Roman runs our board. Our guest this hour is a gentleman who has joined us before. His name is Jason Gregory. Jason's new Inner Traditions Bear and Company 2016 release, entitled Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature, points out that enlightenment comes from the inside out. The most important mystery that we encounter, Jason writes, is our endeavor to be free in this life, and it is what we seek, but we already possess it. Continuing, he says, the accepted notion of success is to assure that our very existence is wrong and that somehow we need to make it right. The idea he will show us, as he does the readers of his work, is that we already possess enlightenment. This is not generally accepted among most people or traditions. And so I ask, is it really that simple? Is it possible for each of us, all of us, to find peace within and there for each of us, all of us, to help manifest that peace in the world? Join us for a wonderful and compelling journey through the landscapes within us now. Thank you for rejoining us, Jason. It's great to be on, Sahara. Um, Always a pleasure to speak to you. You know, of course, you upset many apple carts of spiritual disciplines in the world tradition with this book, which is one of the reasons I loved it. I'm going, oh, my God, this guy writes exactly what I think. (laughs) (laughs) So let's begin where you did, because, you know, you don't come to this awareness by just sort of sitting down and studying traditions and thinking about it and then writing a book. So how did you find that the path itself was the journey and the tools are not the journey itself. <laughs> well, it took, it took obviously a long time and to, to realize that basically. So um, like yourself probably as well, Zoe. But, um, you know, basically, you know, some of my core teachings that I've followed for a long time have been mainly Zen Buddhism and uh, Advaita Vedanta in, in India. And, and both of those traditions actually always speak about, you know, in Zen they always speak about like, we're all we're always been in nirvana, but we don't realize it, and and so forth and so on. And in Advaita Vedanta, they they always tell you to give up the search, you know, the search of striving and and so forth and so on, because they, from their opinion, you know, we already have it, whatever that may be, the in, the enlightenment we are seeking, you know. So we already have it, but the problem is is our search for it, and um, the further we go out into the world, um, striving for success, striving for um, spiritual enlightenment, striving for whatever, is always getting away from um, our true nature where we already are. So it's a, it's basically about coming back into that realization that we already have it. So for me personally, um, I haven't really lived in, I, I would say, a, a Western society for a long time, um, probably five years now, but over the last 10 years, probably only a few years I've been in Western society, and I've mainly been living in Asia and so I've been around a lot of teachers, a lot of people practicing these, um, this, this type of philosophy and, you know, actually applying it to their lives to see if there's any truth to it. So, you know, me, uh, I've, I've always been pretty uh, curious about everything. So I, I did it as well. I've, I've applied it to my own life and I've seen the benefits in my own life and I've seen the, the truth in it, actually. Um, you know, you can just, if you, if the listener looks at it, you know, just basically, if you if you leave your familiar environment and you put yourself in a different environment um, with nothing to do, completely nothing to do, what you'll feel is your complete, your whole nervous system will begin to relax. Your mind will begin to come back down to the ground, more more of the root level where you're not overthinking about the tasks that you have to do today and and this and that. And then you'll you'll you start to feel this all encompassing sort of peace within yourself that not even in the in the external world you you're not that disturbed by distractions or by whatever whatever may come your way so you know it's it's as simple as that for me like i've been away from um, my familiar environment which is australia for a long time and i've been in places like tiruvannamalai in india or up in the himalayas in nepal and been disconnected from society and have realized this but again it's you have to eventually come back to society and also live live it from that perspective as well so mm-hmm. that's also the challenge but yeah, exactly that's, that's how it, that's, that's exactly. how i sort of came to it well and and I, what i like so i mean 
It's so interesting because we talked earlier with Joseph Emmett, who wrote Finding the Blue Sky, and he also is a teacher of Zen Buddhism in the Dharma way of Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition. And so I read both of your books, and his first and then yours, and it was really thrilling because his work is focused, this particular book, on that happiness and that we can cultivate happiness, and through cultivating this, we can cultivate peace, both peace within and then obviously peace in the world. And then I read your book, and of course, you throw it all to the wind, but that's after having done it all before it went back to the wind. And and so it's it's kind of like, you know, sometimes if, if, if one hasn't done the long work of self-refinement and self-cultivation, and um, it just sounds like a bunch of words like, oh, yeah, you can be happy. Oh, sure. You can have peace. And, and then, like you said, and I always joke, it takes no effort. It was just the 30 years of preparation. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> there's no work at all. Okay, so you point out some really beautiful, I think, tripping points that our civilization is subject to. And this is one of the ways our our godliness, our divinity, our our innate enlightenment capacity has been veiled. And one of them has to do with time. So share with us this perspective of linear versus non-linearity of time. It's a yeah, good point. Especially it's, it's a good point when you consider, Zoe, when you consider the differences of Western and Eastern thought in general. Like mm-hmm. um, when we go back into history, um, when we see the, for example, the evolution of, uh, Greek civilization and Chinese civilization. Um, there's a distinct focus on uh, different uh, different focuses on, you know, for the, for the Greeks, for example, they'll focus on individuality, which was just a result of the environment, and 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 with China, it was a focus on um, collectivism, more about more of a holistic um, view because um, because the the environment dictated those terms to, towards them. You know, they were in the yellow the Yellow River Valley area of China. And you needed large populations of people to cultivate rice and so forth and so on. Um, so what this leads into is that um, the Chinese, the East, not just China, but the East always had a perspective of um, everything You know, takes a long time. Everything is a process um, either towards something or it's just a process in itself. You know, We're not going out trying to see individual achievements or individual success. We're just doing what is required of us in that present day you could say so i'm not saying that all of the philosophy came from this sort of holistic thing but um what you always saw in east even if you go into india or southeast asia is that they see the world that there is no sort of beginning or end they see that everything is is just process so it doesn't matter um you know, it, it does matter in a sense that, you know, if you want to succeed at something like, for example, I, I set out to write a book. Of course, I want to complete the book. Um, but what do you resonate more with? Do you resonate more with the process or the achievement of getting it published and so forth and so on? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, you can you can take both as well, which is what I choose to do. But um, from the Eastern perspective, the, the, the point of the whole exercise is the process. So this is why when you go into China or Japan, and they, they train you in calligraphy, for example. Calligraphy is just about trying to disengage your mind from thinking about achievements and beginnings and end and just be in the process of having what they would call a, a, an effortless mind. So having a mind that's not stuck, that's just in the motion or, you know, as Mihai Csikszentmihalyi would say, in the flow of the immediate moment um, where basically your mind has converged with nature, um, which is what um, the Chinese probably would say. And so, yeah, this goes way back, um, like what we said, like, and this goes into enlightenment. So when we look at enlightenment, um, when we look at it from a, say, say if we look at it from our own Western mind, when, when the West was introduced to the East, for example, the notion of enlightenment was there, especially in Buddhism and Hinduism. And so people thought, well, how, how can I get this? You know, cause, and then enlightenment becomes this goal, this achievement that we, we need to, um, strive to succeed, whereas you know in the in the heart of a lot of the the Buddhist tradition and the Hindu tradition is that we have to sort of get away from that way of thinking that way of thinking has actually eclipsed the enlightenment that we already have, so we have to 
re, almost retrain our, our our perception to see that that the that life itself is just process. Even even our lives, though, um, you know, I I can see my life as being born and dying in the physical sphere, but from the Eastern perspective, everything is process. And then once that process is finished, then well, I shouldn't say finished, but when that process is sort of um, re- reached its pinnacle, it 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 moves on to another process, and then. And this is how they they have the, the concepts of reincarnation and so forth and so on. So, mm-hmm. the, you know, these are the the ideas. But again, it's about training our mind to think in terms of process rather than beginning and end. So, always having the the holistic view, the the, the big picture in mind instead of the small picture. You mm-hmm. know? And and then there was another component, and I thought it was just a brilliant insight. You were talking about monarchical consciousness. Mm. Um, and that we have this within ourselves, and and this whole notion of hierarchical realities. Describe for us why this impinges, basically, on each of us um, experiencing this enlightenment. It's a good point. Yeah. Well, basically, and it's not. It, this is a. This is a not just a, a Western problem. It's also an Eastern problem as well, where we find uh, sort of the moment. We have a monarchical sort of perspective of um, the world, the universe, we could say, and this goes back into um, Darius the First in Persia, where you know we had an epoch of time where you had Pythagoras, um, Conf- Py- Pythagoras in Greece, we had um, Lao Tzu and Confucius in China, we had Gautama the Buddha in India, and all of these individuals were sort of um, under the same agreement in in certain terms about how the universe is, about um, its connectivity, about its sort of unified perspective, um, about how it's sort of the, the universe is an organic structure, not something that's created or or made. And then you have Darius I in that same epoch who came out of nowhere, um, who brought in the King of Kings tradition, which is basically that um, the universe ha- has a particular... God, God, he, Darius turned God itself into a lord, mm-hmm. into a ruler into a ruler so then um we had from that perspective then that infiltrated into all society into even our our the fabric of the way that an individual thinks and this became uh, an aspect of obviously christianity and islam um judaism to some extent and also you know in some of the um hindu traditions you see the the idea of the the creator god the, the ruler the all ruler the almighty and you know you can see some benefit in this from a spiritual perspective, but um, what happens then is that you take our nat- our naturalness away from us, and you you build sort of a uh, a monarchical structure. You know, in the Tao Te Ching, they say um, the Tao um, um, the Tao does not lord it over anything, but it loves and nourishes all. So. It's nature itself is organic and we are a part of it. We're not separate from it. So what happens when we have a monarchical view? We, we are then subject to a king. So this is a problem. When we're a subject to a king, then our whole thought structure it goes away from the way nature actually is, basically away from how our mind actually functions. And we start to think then in terms of levels and layers and how we need to reach certain um, certain things in life based on, on, on this monarchical view. So then that is obviously superimposed over into enlightenment. So then we start to think enlightenment is something um, in levels and layers that we need to reach to succeed this certain goal. And this comes, I think, from the, the deep, deeply entrenched um, hypnosis of the monarchical view because, you know, before Darius I, even in... Um, and a lot of the traditions back then, there was not the idea that God was an almighty ruler. Though, I, to be sure, there is um, some research that says that Sigmund Freud, um, he suggests that uh, Akhenaten actually brought in the idea of the um, the ruler God. So basically, he, he thinks that Akhenaten was the first to, to ch- turn the universe into what, what you could basically say is a political analogy. So... And, well, um, one of the things I find, so we have to take a break and we'll come back and talk about this more thoroughly because there aren't many people thinking about 
enlightenment in this way. I mean, your your book is just splendid. Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature by Jason Gregory, a 2016 Inner Traditions Bear and Company releases. And we'll come back and talk about this, is that our submission to rule, you comment, annihilates the freedom that is innately ours. And you just speak to my heart. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, somebody else gets it. And then when I found out, I've been writing about the white spirit animals and I've never been like a real student of Buddhism. I've always been an appreciator of Buddhism. And I was reading because of my writing on the elephants uh, about Buddha. And in the Lotus Sutra, I didn't realize that the Bo- Buddha's last teaching in his life was telling people, you know, not to follow a teacher. And bless him, you know, and that's not to say one doesn't have teachers, but following a teacher and having a teacher are very different things. We'll be right back. Jason Gregory is our guest. Learn more at his website, www.jason, J-A-S-O-N, Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y.org, and the book entitled Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature. I am Amit Goswami, author of The self Universe and How Quantum Activism Can Save Civilization. And we're listening to 21st Century Radio with Zohara Anonymous. It's a wonderful show of the new paradigm that is going on right now. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Zoe Hieronymus. First caller, 410-922-6680, that knows the name of our guest this hour. His book is entitled Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature, an Inner Traditions 2016 release. Call us at 410-922-6680, WCBM 680, or 1-800-WCBM 680. So not mentioning your name for a moment. Um, it's like the mystery guest, and who is our mystery guest? Um You explained that religion, and I love this statement, religion treats enlightenment the way science treats matter. I mean, it's it's a really beautiful analogy. Can you um, flesh that out a little bit for us? Um, Well, basically, I think what we were getting at before the break was, um, like you said beautifully, that um, we we um, our freedom becomes. Eclipse because we feel subject um, to rule, basically. So when we look at um, religion treating enlightenment the same way as science treats matter, if I am right, if I'm getting it, are we... (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So basically, um, what could I say... Um, well, we'll come back for a moment because I think that we, you know, rather than jumping to its conclusion, let's come back to the submission to rule. Because we have a very um, submissive society, even though people think they're radically free. Um, and and certainly there might be ways in which we exhibit some sense of freedom. But this notion that there's authority and authority over us and they tell us what to believe and we're supposed to believe it even if we don't. And when children challenge it, they get punished. Um, And if you challenge authority, you'll be punished in hell or afterlife or whatever it is. There's all these um, stumbling blocks of what I really think of as mind control. I don't know any other way to put it. Because if you go to the school of self-experience, and the school of self-proving, and the school of self-refinement, and and the school of you know self-observation, you find a whole other story. Yeah, and a totally different kind of life experience. Exactly, exactly. Well, so like anything to do with our you know with our liberation, you know, on a spiritual level, like when we have, you know, like what we were talking about before, when we have the monarchical view, we start to think about. Um, Everything in the sense of we have to appease a ruler, um, we have to appease, you know, and that and that goes down into education where we have to appease our teacher, then we're our parents, and then onto our jobs and so forth and so on. So I'm not saying that that you shouldn't do what your parents are saying, but it becomes so deeply entrenched that when we when we seek to be free in this life, when we want to be completely free in this life, a lot of people their traditions, their way of seeing the world is what actually stands in their way. 
actually. And it's so difficult for people to 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 eliminate that. Like I was speaking to an American friend and an American friend was really concerned about the the, the current election and, and so forth and so on. And and But they kind of came to me with, you know, like that they wanted to be free of the the American, what could you say, the, the American conditioning, the American control. But they didn't know steps or, or what methods or paths to, to eliminate that, to transcend that. And I was kind of saying, like, you don't have to, in a sense, transcend it, but you need to understand it on a deeper level that America itself shouldn't be seen, that the idea of America shouldn't be seen as a dictator over you. It shouldn't be seen as the, the, the ruler over you. You need to see it with more clear vision. And so then it comes back to, can we get rid of the hypnosis that I'm Australian, that so was American, that the guy down the street is Catholic, and so forth and so on. And and we can do that, but we don't have to, again, we don't have to eliminate the, the label itself. We just need to retrain our mind to, to know that these are just subjective viewpoints. These are just term, just, just uh, English terminology to define certain characteristics or certain people that we've all agreed upon. So, you know, this goes over into enlightenment where we've got the, the, the law of God bound to scripture, um, which creates all sorts of dogmas and psychosis within us. And so we need to eliminate that. And so we need to understand then, as I talk about in the book, that the map itself is, is not the territory. And this is, again, a big thing that we've all misunderstood, even on a nationalistic level. Like when we look at, say, if I say Australia or America, we, get a, we become patriotic and associated with the label when the map is about the, – the, the, the terrain of that map, of a nationalistic map, is about how we can live as one community. That's what it's about. So when we look at the map of religion, which is doctrine, it's about how we can have a relationship with spirit, with um, with with God, basically, and and with each other. And so most of us are confusing um, the map with the territory, and, and we see this with the wars between the Christian and um, Muslim world. We see this between nationalistic wars, and so forth and so on. So we need to, you know retrain our mind to understand that the map is not the territory and you know you need a good map you need a good um like you said before a lot of like what you said before before the break so was about you know teachers it's good to have teachers but we need to remember that in the end the teacher needs to you need to let go of the teacher mm-hmm. and like what buddha spoke about in the in the lotus sutra and this is what I, you know a lot of you probably know this as well. A lot of gurus, in especially in India and Western gurus who have popped up around the world, they really want just disciples. They want people followers. And when someone steps out of line, or when, when someone questions the guru, they usually get just get thrown out of the out of the group. Of you know, course, it becomes, yeah, it becomes very cultish at that level. Well, it happens and, in in you know mosques, it happens in churches, it happens in synagogues, it happens when somebody falls out of the basic precepts. Um, and I'm not talking about exactly. behavior because as I always say, well, I don't really care who you are or what you believe or what you've studied. I care about your behavior. You know, I, and because that's what I'm trying to do in my own development. My, and I've discovered that, of course, the inner work is much harder work than doing this or that in the world or this or that for this person or this or that project. I mean, those are all wonderful things to be of service in the world. But it's the truth really is it's not as much what you do, but how you do what you do. And, exactly, and, exactly. And, yeah, and, and, and it's the, really true. And, but our culture doesn't teach us that. You know, they teach us the most obnoxious people win, the most foul mouthed <laughs> people are listened to, the most ridiculous candidate can come before the public who has nothing to offer other than, you know, TV reality show culture. And yeah. people are hypnotized into thinking that this is actually substantial. Exactly. Exactly. And, and like, <laughs> yeah, but we. Like we we could talk a lot about the presidential candidacy. Oh God, but we let's not. We we'll both get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm a registered libertarian, so we already know about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, and, and like what we were speaking about the, the monarchical view. Like when we look at a teacher, it can become very monarchical. You know, mm-hmm. like a, a guru 
then assumes this role as the as the Lord, as as almost like a spokesman of God. Mm-hmm. Without without considering that we are all in 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 a sense we're all an aspect of that, you know, one source, whatever yes. you want to call it. Yes. So a guru loses sight of this, and then I've been around many gurus, and it, it's interesting when you when you have them one on one. You know, it's very casual mm-hmm. the, the conversation. It's very you know it's it's enlightening. You're talking just freely with them. You could be talking about you know a, a car, yeah. a car for example, something unrelated. And then once their disciples and their followers come around, they they begin to uh, assume this different persona their their shoulders sort of go back a bit they stand up straighter and um they begin to speak more as if they're on a cloud and you know it's very it's it's not real in some sense a lot of a lot of what's going on in the, in the spiritual world especially around gurus and so forth and so on i could mention a few but i won't no um <laughs> we don't want you to no no <laughs> but um the, the whole the whole idea is that you know as buddhist Buddha states is that you know the you know the teaching is good. You can follow a teaching, for example, but how how are you how are you associating towards that teaching? Are, are you um be are you throwing adulation towards the actual teacher, or are you following what the teaching is saying? You know, we see this with all religions. We see this with all people who follow a certain guru. So in the end, um, what we know from the ancient East is that once you have once, when when you used to go into an ashram, for example, in India, they used to say, for example, you needed to stay for twelve years under under the um, right, right. Uh, under the care of a guru. But then, most good gurus, if they noticed that, say, if Zoe was already becoming free and she was looked like she could enter back into the world and not be swayed by this and that, but could end up, you know, being a, a positive influence for society, they would tell you just to leave, mm-hmm. you know, like it's, it's time for you to leave. You're hanging on now to the guru. So it's time for you to leave and, and go out to the world because it's pointless for you saying here, you're just becoming a, a spiritual tourist under my care, you know. So, um, but that's been lost now in the world. Everyone wants to cling to everything. Everyone wants to hold on to everything. And people, this comes about by looking at the world in the sense of monarchy. Like we look at, God as a father who cares for us, um, who takes care of us, who's going to provide us with food or provide us with a positive experience. Or punish us, we... rain, rain down on us with fire and brimstone. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So so, you know, we... so coming back, though, to this, this innate enlightenment that we already have and that the pursuit of it gets in the way of actually experiencing it because we're chasing it like something outside ourselves that's so head in time. So we get stuck in this notion that it's somewhere ahead, that it's in the future, and if it's not tomorrow, maybe it's in the afterlife, uh, mm. when in fact that's the work of being human and incarnating is to really come into self, at least it's my perspective and my life experience that, that the all ultimate charge other than being of service while you're here is self-mastery and i don't mean this through you know doing horrible things to yourself Mm. rather than expecting of yourself proper conduct you know kindness and generosity and forgiveness and hope and faith and that doesn't mean that you don't have anger and use it appropriately like you know the boundary of a river to keep the water from flooding Mm. but but i all but i generally find that so many teachings um, are about it being somewhere else that you get by doing something else for someone else who will tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like you know what I speak about in the book, and 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 why the title is called Enlightenment. Now is um, it's all in the present. So, for example, you know, if we're looking in the future for something for for enlightenment, for example, or which is usually based on our past experiences, the way we look into the future. Um, but when the, the way that the East look at it, and, and in some Western es- esoteric circles, is that eternity, if we look at eternity, for example, eternity is not something within the realm of time because it's eternal. It has to be, in some sense, the outside of the realm of time, but within it. So this is the idea of nirvana is samsara, samsara is nirvana in Mahayana Buddhism. So the idea is that, you know, a lot of us think that we are going to travel to, I mean, at the end of death, we are going to travel to the heavens or to uh, to heaven, if you're a Christian. Um, and 
that's where you'll be in the bliss of, of God, bliss of the eternal realm and so forth and so on. And I like what Joseph Campbell once said. He said, if, if you don't get it now, you'll never get it. So he, he meant that. He meant that in a sense from even at death, you'll never get it. So um, what, what he meant was that eternity is, where, is the realm where time and thinking cut out. So, and the only realm where time and thinking cut out is in this present moment. And basically, as we live our life, as you said, towards mastery, towards self-actualization, is the more we come into resonance with that present moment, the more we bring our attention back into the present moment. And that can be with anything too. I mean, that can be within meditation. That can be within if you put your f- attention into a f- focal point of creativity, which allows your mind to be effortless for a, for a certain amount of time. All of these things begin to cultivate that more of that awareness of that sense of unity that we that we have deep within us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of people call that oneness, but it's a it's a real sense of unity. So, it's kind of a feeling that everything is one. It's not kind of like you you, you know, you're dancing around singing kumbaya everything is one. It's it's <laughs> much <laughs> It's much different to that, you know. It's kind of a it's a it's a state of consciousness. And By the way, I, remember, I used to love singing that song, "Kumbaya, <laughs> my lord, Kumbaya." <laughs> I think everybody did once upon a time. So, and it's more of a like, like what Sadhguru said. It, it's more of a meditative state. Like it's not that you're in a state of meditation. Your consciousness is more in a meditative state where you're more present. So you're more present in conversations. You're more present in listening to people. You're more present in eating food. You're more present in going for a walk down the street. More present in organizing the interviews for your show, so forth and so on. You, you have mm-hmm. a tremendous amount of presence. And when, it's interesting. There's a lot of literature out there now that says that presence is one of the key aspects of uh, charisma, actually. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you look at charismatic people, charismatic people have a tremendous ability to be, to be very present with with everybody with mm-hmm. most people and yeah a lot of, at, yeah a lot of people at, are, go ahead i was going to say a lot of people are put off by it because usually people uh, are in normal conversations where everyone's waiting for their next term to speak so it and and when someone's sitting there when their eyes are very glued at you and they're very present it can be very intimidating for a lot of people mm-hmm. but it but it really comes say. down to attention and that's why i it's such a beautiful thing to watch Buddhism, whether it's Mahayana Buddhism or any other kind, come into complete alignment with um, historically with the very present understanding of the science of consciousness and light. And that this notion of attention is not just like, yeah, guys, you got to pay attention if you want to get anywhere. It's really the key and intention. So we have these two very basic um, words that are often pass by as just being descriptive of something that we do occasionally. Oh, yeah, I paid attention to what my husband said. Oh, yeah, I intend to go shopping tomorrow. Versus appreciating that those are really the keys to the sense of peace and being present. Because it's, I like the way the physicists I've interviewed over the years have talked about it when they, when they speak to um, when we pay attention we allow what universe is present to pop out at us. And if our intention is to find the answer to a challenge, whether it's internal or external, personal or global, you know, local or national, then we pay attention to what happens in our life. And I'll just give a really short example of driving on the highway and seeing a woman who's car is getting a flat tire and I'm with this other driver and we're both commenting oh my god she's gonna she's gonna have a flat we have to get her attention and tell her which we tried to do and she wasn't really pay attention and then we comment well when you're gonna get a flat you definitely know it right and we both going yeah and then all of a sudden I'm in this car and a light comes on and we look up real fast what it is and I said oh my god it's a low tire pressure so we immediately got off the highway and as soon as we got off we had a flat tire so here it was, we're talking about compassionately, looking out for this other woman who was attention we couldn't get. And universe is saying, pay attention to your tire. So that that's what I mean by attention and intention. And you point out that this monarchical point of view that we were talking about earlier is an internal experience as well. So our ego will govern the body and not listen to the body's needs. And that's we all know about personally. Exactly. And, and, and that's one of the, the big tricks. Um, 
a lot of us, uh, especially, become disassociated with the body because of that reason too. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, they don't look at their, like you said, with the flat tire, people will not look at their health and they, they might have something wrong with their health, for example, but the ego will, again, either, you know, choose to ignore it or pretend it's something that's not worth, you know, at- attention or, mm-hmm. or care. And so we have this this monarchical split within us as well. So we have a body that has a nervous system that has a natural expression coming through it from the universe, but we have also have this this ego that we all have, this persona system that we find in the, the prefrontal cortex of the brain where we can discern between this and that and we overly identify that with with that without letting a lot of things naturally come about into the world. So then we have a split within in our mind between mm-hmm. between the ego and the body. Or, and then it's or, like or this can... little mini inner war. And it's almost as if, you know, we could learn to respect the vessel that the soul is in and that it's how we have these experiences, our, our culture, all of us, the world would be a lot better. We have to take a brief break. Our guest is Jason Gregory, his wonderful new book, Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature for All Free Seekers, no matter what discipline you come from or tradition you've been in. I think you'll find it extraordinarily liberating. Hi, this is Dr. Eric Pearl, author of The Reconnection, Heal Others, Heal Yourself, and founder of Reconnective Healing. You can learn more about us at www.theconnection.com and you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zoe Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Jason Gregory is our guest and don't forget all of our guests and all of our shows are archived for free at www.21stcenturyradio.com so you can download them and listen to them again, share them with others. His book, Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature, is an Inner Traditions Bear and Company 2016 release. And you can learn more at Jason's website, www.jason, J-A-S-O-N, Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, dot org. So I love the fact in your book you talked about Kabbalion, Kabbalion, which is one of my favorite books, Hermetic Philosophy, because it really puts together the fundamentals of what I would say are shared by all traditions on planet Earth who understand that each of us is an element of the divine. And one of them um, you talk about is mentalism. Another is the principle of correspondence. And the other, the principle of vibration and the principle of rhythm. I mean, these are very fundamental realities that get um, often overlooked. Share with us why you've included these and why they're important. Exactly. Well, when you look at uh, the Hermetic philosophy, it's, you know, you could almost, it almost goes exactly the same as like if you look at Taoism, like Taoism, they don't use specific laws, but they think about it in similar way. So, and again, you need to think about these laws in a certain sense to build a a framework of of how the universe actually, you know, conducts itself Mm -hmm. and how, and, (laughs) and how you do as well. So... These are basic, especially when you're talking about um, enlightenment, because when you talk about enlightenment, I talk a lot about in the book in about um, enlightened attunement. So um, what that means is attuning um, your consciousness to um, – I know I talk about levels and, and states and that in the book, but attuning your, your consciousness to a higher state. So that means, again, um, not allowing your – for example, not allowing your attention to be caught in too much detail, too much, um, too much noise in the world. Which, again, when you refrain from that and you bring and you bring your consciousness, you become sovereign over your consciousness and bring it back within. Then you begin to see reality more clearly at at a higher perspective. So, um, and this corresponds to to rhythm. Um, the law of rhythm. When when you when you have sort of refrained from allowing your attention to be caught in the detail, you notice that there is a certain rhythm not only in the world but in your own life that you can continue to follow peacefully. And it'll take you. It's kind of like the Taoist view of um, the Taoist sort of taking you down the river to the to the ocean if you don't resist it. You know, if you resist it, then you begin to drown. 
And we basically have a culture and a society that is continually resisting their own life, resisting their life circumstances, and and are suffering accordingly. You know, it doesn't mean we, we you don't resist all the time. If someone is trying to take advantage of you, it's it's probably best to say to um to say something to them instead of just let them walk all over you. So, um, there are so many reasons that that they are are important to understand. You know, law of correspondence basically is the the understanding of as above, so below. So meaning that um, the big picture is actually a reflection of the small picture and vice versa. And we ourselves are the small picture. So the more we... But the um, big picture is in us. The big picture is in us, exactly. Well said. So, so, And when we understand that, that the big picture is within us, then we, we begin to... Um, in, in some sense, act from that place. So we act from that. Um, in, in the East, they would say that's kind of like a non-dual perception. A non, uh, this is the essence of non-dualism, in, in, especially in, in Vedanta and in Mahayana Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism. There is an element of non-dualism where if you take your perception up to, if you refine it and you attune your perception, you begin to realize that, the, that to use Sanskrit terminology, that the Atman, which is um, the, the true self, your true self, which is undifferentiated consciousness, is identical with Brahman, which is the ultimate reality of the universe within everything. So, um, And you're a mirror of that. You are that. And it's an ability of trying to resonate with that more. That's the predicament for... Uh, for all of the mystics that had lived in the East and, and in the West, I believe too, mm-hmm. in some traditions, that it's that's the the main goal is to come into harmony with that within yourself more. And then when you begin to do that, then your life starts to take a certain shape. It starts to go its own way. It doesn't mean you drop off and become a sadhu and live on the street. It can mean that, but it can also mean that you live your life in accordance with whatever you resonate with peacefully and you just you, you live your life you know with with no friction no suffering and so a lot of these laws are uh, they go and there is a lot of depth to the laws but they are very important to understand uh, if anyone yeah. wants to and, and and i agree you know people have said sometime that i sound dismissive of all traditions and i'm that's not really the point the mm-hmm. traditions are tools but they're not the answer and they're they're not the inner arrival. The inner arrival is where you're headed. It's not out there. And someone's not going to give it to you and you can't buy it. The only way to get it is to do it and to practice within ourselves. And and that's really the truth. And unfortunately, you know, people are told, well, you come to this workshop and you spend $5,000, you're going to go home, you know, a saint. (laughs) Well, that's terrific. But that's not something anybody can give you. Just no. like nobody can give you freedom. They can take it away. We humans can take other people's freedom away. Mm. But the only way to really arrive at freedom, it's a very personal arrival. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I, and I thought there was this um, really lovely thing you said, which is common also in the Hasidic tradition of Judaism, which I've been a student of for so long in my life, is this and that, you know. Our culture is so dualistic that it always wants us to choose, you know, between this party and that party, this uh, this um, this car and that car. Um, you know, it's always this or that. But the truth is, it's always this and that. And that's very Zen as well. You know, as you write to, you write to this point. It's, it's to get to the point where, and I like the way my teacher in Torah used to say it, is whether it's somebody offends you or praises you your response won't be any different. Whether you're meeting with a pauper or a king, it doesn't make any difference. And and all of these things, you know, when you hear them when you're younger, you go, that is just so much talk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's just a bunch of words. But yeah. then when you actually start to live these things as you get older and you've gone through the misery of your own great effort <laughs> and yeah. then relax a bit around just looking at your behavior, that's at least my feeling and my experience, then you can embody these things. And then they're no longer just words, they're experiences. Share with us, though, your perception on this and that. 
I like how you brought that up. So, it, it, and I like how you said, you know, when you start to look at yourself, that's when you start to see these as living realities. You know, a lot of us, you know, especially like you said, when we were children, we discount it because it does seem like a lot of wordplay. But um, yeah, when you look at this and that, like for example, you know, a lot of in the East, there's always the talk about the the game of black and white. So the game of black and white is basically the game of this and that. So good and bad, right and wrong. Um, white man, black man, you know, we, how far do we want to go with this, this and that category? And the problem is, is um, as Zhuangzi points out, he points out in um, the, the text, you know, with his name, Zhuangzi, is that reality itself is impartial, basically meaning that our opinions of this and that are, are based on our opinions, are based on our subjective viewpoint. So, and if, that, if it's based on our subjective viewpoint, then who's this and that is right or wrong? So is Zoe right or am I right? Or are we both wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and in the East, they, they always focus on that we should be trying to refine this, this and that aspect of ourself. We should be trying to almost eliminate it. You know, in, in Sanskrit, they have the term vivika, and vivika means discrimination or discernment. And vivika can, they say, eclipse... Th this impartial non-dual reality where we see things as they are instead of how we think they should be so when we're sitting around going oh this is that way that is this way um and so forth and so on then we are we are causing you know not only we're, in, we're not only hypnotizing ourselves, but we're not seeing reality for what it is so i'm gonna and close the evening with this is our time to say goodbye and that is the truth <laughs> Jason Gregory, thank you so much for being with us. Enlightenment Now, Liberation is Your True Nature, Inner Traditions 2016, www.jasongregory.org. <laughs>